Thank you for coming here. Today I'm going to describe Kapla, which is our system to enable policy compliance for database-backed web application systems. And this is joint work with my advisors and colleagues from MPI, SWS, and University of Maryland. So web applications serving many different users often store and access their data from database management systems. And a lot of their data is confidential. Examples of such applications include healthcare systems that handle confidential patient records, personnel management systems that handle confidential employee records and their information such as salaries and ages, and even conference management systems that handle the submissions and reviews which need to be handled confidentially. So these applications need to comply with many different data access policies associated with their confidential data. However, these policies can be very complex and fine-grained, and specifying and enforcing these policies can actually be a challenging and non-trivial task for the applications. Let me show you an example from HotCrop, a popular conference management system, how policy checks are currently implemented in the application, and why ensuring correct enforcement of these policies is non-trivial. And in this talk, I'm going to use the conference management system as a running example. So today, developers try to enforce these policies within the application code. Here we have a snippet of the PHP code from Hotcraft, which loads the reviews of a paper on behalf of a user. Do not try to read the code. I'll walk you through the important parts of it and explain what it is doing. So at the beginning, the code invokes a function to actually fetch the reviews for a paper that is requested by the user. And then in this function, there are some checks based on the role of the user in the conference and the conference space to determine whether certain fields of the review records from the database should be accessed. Then there is a function called to actually fetch the reviews based on the user's request for a particular paper. And this is where the core logic of this particular function is implemented. Now for each row that is returned in this function call, there are some additional checks implemented on those rows. These are based on the role of the user, their conflicts, or the conference phase. And depending on whether these checks succeed, the review row is returned, or else it may be suppressed in this function. There are some more checks further down in the PHP code before returning these reviews to the end user. So basically, the policy checks are mangled or in line with the application logic. And such inline checks appear throughout the code of the application as it accesses different parts of the database based on different user requests. Now, as the applications or the policies evolve, developers must continuously update the security checks to ensure policy compliance. And for this, they may need to visit many different code parts within the application. And this makes it very easy to miss the policy checks in some code path or implement these checks incorrectly. So maintaining the compliance code in the application in this way is a cumbersome and error-prone process, and it can lead to data leaks. And indeed, data leaks have been reported in hot trap in the past due to such policy compliance violations. Note that this problem is not limited to hot trap but it arises in other kinds of database-backed web applications as well, like the ones I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. So far, I've showed you one approach that developers often use to ensure policy compliance, and this is by implementing checks within the application code. And I've showed you that this is an error-prone approach because bugs in the application code can lead to policy violations and cause data leaks. Now, alternatively, Developers could rely on the native access control support that is provided by some of the database management systems, such as PostgreSQL, Oracle, or SQL Server. However, as also mentioned in the previous talk, the access control support from the databases is not sufficient to specify and enforce all kinds of policies that applications are typically interested in enforcing. And in particular, the developers may need to make some modifications to their database schema or to the application queries, or even both to ensure correct policy compliance. And because of this reason, the database access control support is not actually widely used by many applications. So given the limitations of these two approaches, our goal is to separate policy compliance from the application code and the database management system to prevent data leaks. And for the policy compliance to be comprehensive and effective, we need to be able to specify the complex and fine-grained data access policies that the applications are interested in. 
And moreover, we want to be able to enforce these policies without adding significant overhead for the end users of the application. So in the rest of this talk, I'll present our policy compliance system, which is Coupla, that achieves these goals. I'll describe Coupla's two main components, that is its policy specification framework and its enforcement mechanism. And then I'll describe some of our evaluation results with using this uh, system to enforce policies for some applications. So Coupla is a policy compliance system for database-backed applications, and it ensures compliance independent from the application code and the database. In Coupla, declarative policies are associated with the database schema, and they are stored in the database management system, separate from both the application code and the application data. And Coupla enforces these policies in a reference monitor between the application and the database management system. Typically, the web applications use database adapters, which are libraries that provide a uniform interface to connect with the database management system. So Coupla can be easily integrated with this database adapter, and therefore it can be deployed across different kinds of web applications and across many different database management systems. Coupla's reference monitor intercepts each application query and rewrites the query with the policy that must be enforced on the, uh, on the query. The database management system executes this rewritten query and returns the result to the reference monitor. Now, these results are already policy compliant, so the reference monitor can directly forward them to the application. Now, you might wonder that since Coupla reference monitor modifies the application's query, it potentially changes the semantics of the application query. And therefore, how it might be modi modifying the functionality of the application. Well, as long as the application's query are already policy compliant, Coupler returns the same results as expected by the original query. However, if the application's query is not policy compliant, then Coupler would return only a subset of the results that are expected in the original query. But these subset of results are compliant with the policies that must be enforced on the data accessed by the query. And this means that if the application is buggy and it issues some non-compliant query, it can still not violate the policies that must be enforced on the data in the database. So before proceeding with the details of Coupla's design, let me quickly describe our threat model. Our goal is to protect against inadvertent data leaks due to application bugs. Therefore, we do not rely on the application to perform correct policy compliance checks but we trust the rest of the software stack, including the database adapter, the Coupler reference monitor, and the database management system. In particular, the Coupler reference monitor authenticates with the database with administrative credentials, and it has the privilege to access all the data tables of the application in order to perform policy enforcement. In the implementation of our prototype, we trust the application to not circumvent the reference monitor, which lies in the same address space as the untrusted application. However, this is not a fundamental limitation, and in principle, we can isolate the reference monitor from the untrusted application using some of the existing techniques, such as software fault isolation or process or address space isolation. Secondly, currently we also trust the application to send the user identity, the correct user identity, to the reference monitor for correct policy enforcement. But again, we can make the user directly authenticate with the reference monitor by completely bypassing the untrusted application. So I've given you a brief overview of Coupla's design and how it enables policy compliance independent from the application code and the database management system. Now let me describe its two components, that is its policy specification framework and its enforcement mechanism that together help to achieve this policy compliance. So I'll start with describing how we specify policies in the Coupla specification framework. In practice, many of the complex policies that need to be enforced on the application queries to the database can be categorized into policies on queries that access single columns, or policies on queries that try to link multiple columns together through various operations such as joins or filters. They can be policies on queries that perform an aggregate with grouping on one or more columns and they can be policies on queries that perform some user-defined functions on the columns. In the context of hot crap, I'll give you examples from the first three classes of policies, but in the paper, we also describe policies on, based on the queries that access user-defined functions. So let me start with the simplest type of policy, that is a policy on a query that accesses a single column. In hot crap, 
authors can see the reviews for the submitted papers only after the decision notification. So in Hotcraft, the reviews of the submitted papers are stored in a reviews table and this other information about the submitted papers such as the authors and outcomes are stored in the paper table. To express the above policy, we specify the policy on the review column from the reviews table and the policy is in the form of a SQL where clause that contains one or more conditions. In this case, we have two conditions. The first condition checks that the current date of accessing this column is after the decision notification deadline. And there's a second condition that checks that there exists an entry in the papers table where the paper ID of the entry matches with the paper ID of the review records in the reviews table and that the user who's accessing this column is actually an author on that particular paper. So note that although this policy is described on the review column, it contains two kinds of conditions. The first condition here applies uniformly to all the values in the column. And the second condition applies differently to each cell of the particular column. And together, these two conditions help to enforce a fine-grained cell-level access control policy on this column. Of course, this is just a partial policy on the review column. A real policy in an actual hot crap content setting would include additional OR clauses that describe access condition for other kinds of users in the system, such as the PC or the chair. Now let me describe a policy on a query that links multiple columns together. Before I give you a concrete example, let me give you an intuition of what a link policy on two or co more columns means. So when two or more columns are read together, a user can learn potentially more information than what they can learn if they could access these columns only individually. And therefore, one may need to specify additional policies to restrict when these certain columns can be linked together. In Hotcraft, for example, authors can see the names of the PC members and they can also see the reviews for the submitted papers independently. But they should not be allowed to link them together because then they, they can learn which reviewer wrote their reviews for the paper. So we express this policy on a set of four columns from the various tables present in the schema. We have the reviews uh, table that I already mentioned, and we have the names for the, of the PC members stored in the contacts table. In the policy, we contain the, we have a set of four columns that includes the review column from the reviews table, the name column from the contacts table, and additionally, the contact ID columns from both the tables, which are actually required to link these two columns together. And the policy on these set of four columns is a SQL way clause that describes that any user who is an author on a paper is not allowed to issue a query that accesses these four columns together. However, note that the users can still access the reviews and the names individually if there are additional policies that are described on these columns. I already gave you an example of a policy on the review column that allows the authors to see the reviews for their papers only after the decision notification. We have a similar policy on the name column in the contacts table that allows all the users to see the names of the PC members. Now let me describe an example of a policy on aggregate queries. So similar to the reviews, the authors can see the outcome of the submitted papers after the decision notification. And this would be a policy described on the outcome column from the papers table. Now what if we want to allow the authors to also see the number of submitted and accepted papers after the decision notification? So we want them to be able to compute some aggregate information, optionally grouping by the different kinds of outcomes that are allowed in the system. So for this, we express a policy on the outcome column from the papers table, and we additionally allow describing the query operators that can be performed on these columns in this case, we want to allow them to count and optionally group by the outcome values. And the policy on this column is, just, is again a simple SQL way clause, which here contains a check that the query is made only after the decision notification deadline. So note that if this policy is not specified, then the authors can only see the outcome of their individual submitted papers, whereas this is the policy that allows them to get the aggregated results. So to summarize, a Kapla policy is specified on a set of columns and it defines constraints on the tables from which these columns are accessed. These constraints are in the form of SQL where clauses on the tables, which describe the, which restrict the set of records that can be accessed from each table, given the set of columns from the left-hand side of the policy are accessed in a query together. 
And this syntax is general enough to describe all the kinds of policies that I've shown you so far. We have more details and examples in the paper about the policy syntax and their applications. Now I would like to describe how Kapla enforces these policies. Consider a table that contains two columns, each of which is subject to a policy. So column one is subject to policy P1, and column two is subject to a policy P2. And additionally, we have a link policy defined on the set of two columns, which is P3. Usually, P3 is at least as restrictive as the conjunction of the policies of the individual columns. Now consider an application query that accesses column one from the table. In this case, Kapla enforces the policy P1 on this query. And to enforce this policy, Kapla rewrites the original query by replacing the table in the query with a subquery of the form select star from T1 where policy P1. Consider a second query that accesses both the columns from the table. These columns can be accessed in multiple ways. They could be projected together or one column can be used to filter out the results for the other column. In this case, Kapla enforces policy P3 on the query since this query is accessing the two columns together and they can be linked together. And as I mentioned before, the link policy is at least as restrictive as the conjunction of the individual policies, so it is sufficient to just enforce policy P3. Kapla will generate a similar rewriting for the, for the original query, where it will replace the table with the subquery on the table. And in this case, the subquery includes the policy condition P3. So essentially, the Kapla reference monitor performs policy enforcement in two steps. First, it identifies the policies that cover the set of uh, columns access in the query, and then it rewrites the query by replacing each table in the original query with a subquery that contains the applicable policy clauses. Now recall that these policy clauses are in the form of SQL where clauses. So generating this query rewriting is a relatively straightforward task. But because SQL is a very complex language and it allows aliasing of columns and tables in the query, the key challenge for Kapla is to identify the set of columns in the query and to determine the applicable policies. I've showed you a simplified picture of our policy enforcement, but it generalizes to also enforce policies on other kinds of queries that include joins, aggregates, or user-defined functions, and we have these details in the paper. So I've described how Kapla's policies are specified on the database schema and how Kapla enforces these policies by dynamically rewriting the queries at runtime. Now I would like to briefly describe how Kapla is implemented and how it affects the application's performance. So the Kapla reference monitor is implemented in about 20,000 lines of C code, which includes the logic for identifying the set of columns from the query and rewriting the query with the application policies. We also provide APIs to create and specify the policies on sets of columns from the database schema. We ported the reference monitor to PHP and Python Django, which are web frameworks which are popular for web application design. We implemented policies for Hotcraft, which is the application written in PHP, and also for our institute's job application portal, which is implemented in Python. In this talk, I'll show you some evaluation results for implementing policies and, and enforcing them for hot crap on MySQL. We also have similar results for the second application system in the paper. We also evaluated Kapla's overheads on a commercial database management system and compared them with the native access control enforcement of the database management system. We do not name the database here due to licensing restrictions, but we, all, we have the detailed evaluation results in the, in the paper. So the hot crap schema consists of 22 tables and 215 columns. In our evaluation, we use an anonymized data set from a previous conference hosting. And we implemented about 30 different policies for a typical conference configuration that included features such as double blind reviewing, handling chair conflicts, and a review process without rebuttals. We had to make some modifications to hot crap to make the application work with Kapla. Typically, applications like Hotcrap perform overly general queries, and they fetch a large amount of data from the database since they rely on their own post-filtering checks as part of their policy compliance implementation. With Kapla in place, these overly general queries tend to return fewer results, and therefore they can potentially break the application functionality. Now, to enable the same functionality as the original application intended, we need it to modify these overly general queries to be more specific. And in case of hot crack, 
This required changing about 150 lines of code out of 52,000 lines of the application code. And most of these changes were localized in a few functions that generate queries on the most of the main tables in the database. We measured the impact of Kaplas policy enforcement on the end user latency. And for this, we selected four different user actions performed by users with different roles in the system. The first action here simulates an author clicking a, the URL of the submitted paper to view the reviews after the decision notification. The second action simulates a PC member clicking a button to save the comments on the paper during the review phase. The third action simulates the chair assigning a conflict for a paper and a PC member and saving this conflict. And the fourth action simulates the chair clicking on a button to run an automatic review assignment task. We measured the latencies of these actions with and without the enforcement. The blue bars here correspond to the latencies of the actions without the enforcement, and the red bars correspond to the latencies with the enforcement in place. The latencies are normalized to the baseline, so all the baseline bars are of height 1. Now, as you can see, in the first three actions, the baseline latency of the actions is about 100 milliseconds, and Kapla adds an overhead of about 30 to 40 milliseconds on these actions. However, this overhead is still well below the user perceptible threshold. On the fourth action, the baseline latency is about 1.5 seconds, and Kapla, with Kapla in place, the latency of the action is about 6.5 seconds. This is because the review assignment is a particularly long-running action in the application, and the application issues a large number of queries as it tries to map each reviewer with each of the submitted paper in the conference. And with our data set, this involved about 3,800 queries, each of which is subject to the Kapla's enforcement. Nonetheless, the overheads are not of a significant concern to us in this case, because the review assignment is an infrequent task that is run only a few times during the conference review period. Finally, Kapla's overheads are mostly due to the execution of the rewritten queries by the MySQL database. A different database management system, which may have a more sophisticated query optimizer than what the MySQL database has, these overheads can be significantly reduced. And in fact, this is what we experience in our evaluation with the commercial database, which we have described in the paper. So now I would like to summarize my talk. I have discussed that database applications need to comply with many different complex and fine-grained data access policies. However, bugs in the application code can lead to policy violations and eventually to data leaks. Kapla provides an effective and comprehensive policy compliance system to protect against such data leaks. Kapla's compliance is independent of any database-specific support for access control. And it is also independent from the application code which means that we do not need to rely on the application to perform correct policy compliance. With Kapla in place, developers may need to make some changes to the application. However, only modest changes are required, and this is only to enable the application functionality. And finally, Kapla has only a moderate amount of overhead for the end users of the system. Thank you, and now I would like to take some questions. Any questions? Please, sure. Hi, I'm uh, Trent Jager from Penn State. Thanks for the nice talk. So um, I was wondering about, um, about identifying the users. Um, so we have access control, so we have to find the subject, the uh, object, and the operation. And so you were saying in your example and in hot crap, it looks like the user identity is sent to the database in the query, whoops, excuse me, in the query sort of as part of the way hot crap works. Mm -hmm. But if it was a, another kind of uh, web application, they may not send the subject identity as part of the query. Is Am I understanding so, this right? So your question is that if, what if the policies were, uh, sorry, the, the queries are not referring to the user identity, but something else? Uh... Well, they just don't include the user identity, yeah. They would just be the query, and they wouldn't identify the user uh, for whom the query was uh, being run. Would you have to change the application to include that information? Um, so um, uh, let me just clarify. So in, in the policies, when we refer to the user identity, that is just part of the policy. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Even if the original query does not include user identity, it does not mean that the query is not being performed on behalf of a certain user. The user has authenticated to the application and the, uh, to the reference monitor and the queries are being performed in the context of that particular user. So even if you are just trying to access some other data, this may not necessarily be referring to user, right? Okay. They would be subject to the policies of the user. So I guess I, I may have misunderstood your slide. So it looked like you said that the, well, so you're saying that the that in Kapla you have a separate process for authenticating the user on uh, for whom the queries are being processed. Uh, yes, we, we we could make the user authenticate directly with the. Oh, manager. I see. So yeah. you you could make the user. Yes. So you haven't yet. Yes. Right now we rely on the application forwarding right. the user or the identity to the reference monitor. Okay. So I guess basically you'll have to retrofit the application to do the authentication. Yes. Yeah or you'll have to retrofit the application to pass its own authenticated user right. identity. Yeah. So you have to do some kind of retrofitting to the to the application side still to get it to work with okay. with Kapla unless the application's already sending yeah. subject information. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, no one else has a question, so maybe I'll ask a whimsical question yeah. instead since we're at the end of the conference. So you had the example about the uh, authors in your you know, example, the authors wanting to find out how many accepted papers there were. Um, now, I would never do this, but as a PC member who's been on PCs a few times, um, you might have a PC member and an author. You might, you, same person might be both. Yeah. And so one thing a PC member who's also an author might want to know is, you know, are, have, have the papers that they're conflicted with, say their own papers, been accepted? And this would be, you know, a side channel, if you will, for revealing that information, right? Because I could find out how many papers were accepted as an author, but I know how many papers were accepted that I'm not that I'm not conflicted with as a PC member, and I could see the the difference. Uh, right. No. So, um, um, so in 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 Hotcraft, of course, uh, the the contacts table stores the information about the users and their roles in the system, right? Mm -hmm. So the the PC member would be identified as a PC member, right? Uh, so when the PC member tries to perform the aggregate query, they would be, so I've shown you just a small simplified version of the aggregate policy, right? But there would be additional clauses that restrict what the PC member can access. So there, there would be additional filter conditions that the PC member can only count based on the number of papers that they are not conflicted with. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay. I just had to check on that. All right. Um, I don't have anything else. You got a question? Okay. Um, while he's walking up, I guess I, I had some uh, some papers I wanted to point out to you after we're done. So sure. Don't yeah. run. Okay. Off. Thanks. Thanks. So, Mark Craven from Amazon. Um, great work. Really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Um, Earlier on, you had our, your little block diagram where you showed the flow of uh, traffic between the application, Qualpa, the database, and how it all went back and forth. You want to look at um, If you like, yeah, that might help folks. Um, so you talked about the, um, the additional constraints, essentially, yeah, uh, to the queries being added by the engine before they got passed to the database and what came back was sanitized or acceptable, and then you've, you've called out their non-compliant queries return fewer results. Does it flag up and say, hey, your query asked for more than you're allowed to see. Here's what you're allowed to see. Go and see your administrator. Or does it just say, here's the answer you asked for? Um, I'm sorry, could you, okay. could you repeat, uh, yeah. repeat okay. the last part? A lot, lot of words, a lot of words, and it's late on a Friday. So um, you talked about getting um, a set of results back. Yes. Uh, and if the query is inappropriate yes. and asking for more than it should, um, the tool steps in, refines the returned data set, and gives that back to the user. Right. Okay. I'm just wondering, does it also report back, hey, your query was bad, here's what you're allowed to see, but you did the wrong thing? Does, right. it, does it alarm? Yes, uh, so the question is whether you can tell the, dev uh, the application or the developers that your query is yep. not compliant already, yep. right? Uh, yeah, so one thing that we can do is we can log the results of the, the, the original query and the rewritten query and tell the, tell the application that there is a mismatch in the results and therefore the, the query is uh, not compliant. Um, 
what, uh, and then, of course, the developers can manually in investigate uh, what could be the cause of this, uh, this inconsistency. I mean, given that the policies are written in SQL, it's actually it's relatively easy for the developers sure. to you know, reason and analyze the, the policy part and then, of, of course, also compare with the uh, application query to determine what, uh, what could be the cause. Uh, but that's, that's the yeah. level of support that I, I'm, So I'm just thinking a little bit bigger, right? So if you, if you used your engine to you use your Quelpa engine to protect uh, databases from more ad hoc queries rather than predefined application queries, um, you know, is it an opportunity to find folks who are being malicious um, and alert on that? Um, or if just, hey, you know, I'm trying to figure out, where, you know, where do you draw the line as to you did the wrong thing or is it, Hey, database administrator, someone's doing something naughty uh, that, that's worth investigating more deeply. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, is that a is that a a, a roadmap item for your for your Qualpa engine to to look at more right. ad hoc queries? Um, so you're asking when the user whether the users could be allowed to perform ad hoc yeah. queries, right? And so so one thing is that um, since the reference monitor is the only one that has uh, the unique administrative privileges to connect to the database and access all the data, uh, as long as this reference monitor is uh, plugged into the interface that the users have to uh, make the raw queries directly to the database, uh, it can provide the protection for uh, okay. um, for the user queries. Uh, but one thing is that uh, we are looking mostly at um, uh, non-malicious setup as of now. So um, the individual user queries sure can be subject to uh, policy enforcement, um, but there might be other kinds of leaks because of the users being able to make some inferences based on the result. Yeah. That is not yeah. something that we are uh, covering right now. Super. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great, let's thank Asta again. Thank you.